Welcome back, everybody, to Engineering 340, 542, uh, Dynamics on Networks. We're at Lecture 12 now out of 16. And I remind you that you guys are giving two of them. So that means we don't have that much time left in the semester. Uh, Giuliano is going to help out today and cover uh, the first half of the lecture, and we'll see how far we get with that. I also want to remind you that the class, as usual, is being live streamed and recorded. So please keep that in mind. So I'd like to quickly go through and if, see if people have uh, their uh, NanoHub application presentations. We got through most of them the other day, but we still have a few left. Uh, get any updates on projects for people to do presentations on projects if they haven't done that already. Uh, if people have any more on the in-class replication exercises, I'd love to hear from that. Uh, and then uh, we will have uh, Giuliano present, uh, and then we'll jump uh, into some discussion of the modeling that we were working on uh, last week. So why don't we start out by uh, going over student reviews of NanoHub applications. I guess who did we still have? I know Ali said you were wanted to do it next week. Delaney, had you you hadn't done yours yet, right? You had the internet connection problem when we were going to do it the last time. Is that right? Right, I did it last time. You did. Okay, I'm sorry. It shows how, how with it. So has everybody done it uh, now? Uh, has anybody not done? It? I think I have re I have records, but uh, they're not always in front of me at the time. I'm in. So if we don't have any of those to do today, uh, how about student project updates? So people have, does anybody have anything they want to show today related to their projects? I will ask you to do that again next week more seriously. Uh, because I think it's important to have a draft project that you can uh, take home and discuss uh, over the Thanksgiving break. So no, no one wants to present. I'm not seeing a wild swelling of uh, enthusiasm. And I guess, does anybody, I'd hope to get some, some feedback on the in-class replication exercises. Does anybody have anything they want to show today about that? Or is that now so far in the past that it's forgotten? It's easier to hide when you're on Zoom. If I were, if we were in the classroom, I could walk over to somebody and just say, talk. But, uh, it's easier to be inconspicuous here. So no. I did not have a presentation on this because there wasn't an assignment on Canvas, I believe, for it. So I wasn't sure what to do for it. Well, I guess I guess since I wasn't since I didn't lead the since I didn't lead the uh, the class this year, uh, I don't know exactly how it was left. Uh, but I was hoping that people could. Uh, present in, in an informal way what they did. In other words, if you, if, you, if you wound up with a Jupyter notebook, you could tell us a little bit about what the exercise was about, what you learned from it, uh, and uh, show your results. Um, but you're right, Delaney, that, that if there was no written assignment, it's a bit unreasonable to ask for, for something uh, dramatic. And so I was thinking of something more informal. But uh, for next year, I, 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 will, I will take your comment under advisement and make sure that there's a written exercise. As, I, as I've said in the email, I've been, I know some people have been a little bit behind on some of the homeworks. And so I've been holding off uh, issuing new homework assignments uh, so that everybody could get back in sync. Uh, I figured that the people who were caught up on the homeworks could spend their time working on their projects. And the people who uh, needed a little extra time to catch up would have that time. So that's that. I didn't want to write a formal assignment uh, when people uh, when people were already feeling overloaded. Okay. Well, in that case, uh, we will move on to Giuliano. In case
Leon, are you ready? Yep. Okay, so I will turn the screen share over to you. Let me just pull everything up here. Uh, screen. Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, so for this first uh, part of the lecture, I'm going to show you how to get your, your projects onto NanoHub afterwards. And if possible, I'd like people to follow me as much as you can. I'll try to take things low, but we'll see. And this is all straightforward, so don't fret too much about it. Uh, so things that you need, um, and you probably have already, a NanoHub account, of course, a GitHub account, which we've talked about GitHub a few weeks ago, and something to interface with GitHub. So in my case, I have git bash down here. That's my interface of choice. And I already have the repository that we are going to use here. So yeah, we'll do it together. I have this GitHub repository that you use. It has all of the infrastructure files that you need and whatnot. Um, and don't mind that phrase about the Python script. I was misremembering the process for CompuCell um, for Tellurium, it's e even easier than that. So you can either fork, clone, or zip download this repository. I recommend that you fork it uh, because it's going to make your life easier, uh, a lot easier, in fact. So if you just go to that link there, which is this repository, and click fork here, uh, you should be able to fork the repository, which is making a personal mirror copy of it um, that you can then change. Um, since I'm the owner of this, if I click fork, I mean, nothing happens, uh, but you should get a confirmation message and just click OK. OK, cool. So yeah, let's do a first poll then. Um, have you gotten to that link and forked the repository yet? Half and half, yeah. But this is literally just going to that link and clicking fork and fork and saying yes or whatever. Um, then next step is to have to open uh, your GitHub interface and then to clone your forked repository. Uh, so actually, let me show you how it looks like for a forked repository. So this repository is mine. I can see it because it's my name slash name of the repository. And down here, I can see that it was forked from COVID tissue models and repository name. And you're going to see something similar when you fork this, but it's going to be your name, Delurium, blah, 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 forked from Juliano Delurium, blah, blah, blah. And after you are on your fork of this repo, you can click on the green code button to get the cloning link, which is not the same as the URL up there. So in here, it would be this link, which is different from the non-forked version of the repository, which is here. 
you can see that this is github.com slash COVID and this is slash my name. So when you go to your version of Telurium Nano Hub base, it should be github.com slash your name slash Telurium blah, blah, blah. And you have that button there to copy the actual link. So I'm trying to do it as well. Do so yep. you want to, to do the download now or what? Uh, no, uh, you're going to clone it to your own PC. So we are just grabbing this HTTPS link here and we are going to do git clone that link on git bash. In my case, it will, it will throw an error because I already have a folder with that name. So it, the link for you should be probably something like this. And where are you cloning that to? Uh, well, I have it on my... Um, the home of my D drive, but that's really customer's choice. You can put it anywhere as long as you remember where it is afterwards. So if I just hit clone, I get an error because that folder already exists, but I can um, tell the clone to go to a new folder by just typing a folder name afterwards. And I do like my folder names to be huge. So I cloned it again to this in cluster room to making folder. Otherwise it would just be the name of the repository would be the folder name. And now if I go to there, I can see that it has all of the files that are also here. Okay, relaunch. I think everybody was done. Oh yeah, fork, cloning. Well, I had slides, <laughs> jumped. Does everyone have git bash installed? Oh yeah, uh, I also have the links here, yeah, let me... Get bash. Okay. So while people are catching up, I'm going to explain a bit of this repository. Um, you only have the only real thing that you have to add here is the Jupyter notebook containing your project, and that will replace this Tellurium Jupyter notebook that is there already. Um, you can so yeah, you can either copy your notebook here or just change the context of this notebook and both should work. Um, and what NanoHub does is that it comes here, it looks for that, make sure that all of these folders are there. And then it looks for a invoke script that does at the actual launching of the tool. And that invoke script is named invoke and always lives in middleware. 
And if I actually open this here on GitHub, we can see that it's a bunch of Linux commands and we don't need to worry about them, but we can already see where you are gonna change which notebook should be opened. So we are gonna change that later. And yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm already here in this second folder that I made and I'm going to copy the notebook that I'm gonna use later on in class there. So I have this widget class notebook that I'm gonna use later. And if I go here in class delivering toolmaking, I'm just gonna copy this to here. So what I'm actually this order is better. So what I'm going to do now is here on my local repository, I already have this extra notebook and I'm actually gonna tell NanoHub that this should be the notebook that they should open afterwards. So I'm gonna go to middleware, have the info file there. It doesn't have an extension. So I'm gonna right click and when my computer decide, yeah. And I'm, it's a text file, so you can open with, with anything really. And I'm gonna change this start Jupyter command to use this notebook instead. So instead of delirium.ipib, I'm using widgets class that I did. And save. And if you don't have your project notebook ready, you can always change that later. I mean, that's one of the advantages of using GitHub. Changing things is easy. Okay. So yeah, I only opened this middleware invoke file and replaced delirium.ipip Oh, I buy and I should say, um, with widgets class dot notebook. Um, and there is actually one more thing that we have to change here. And this one is actually a bit more important uh, because uh, we have to actually give your uh, the tools, well, a name, but also a short name. If I go here to Tellurium, or if I go to NanoHub, actually, and I open any of these uh, tools, their splash page, we can see that Tellurium is tool slash Tellurium. This one, which was a 
class project, the URL is tools slash radiation sim. And this one is tools slash BSVIRD COVID-19 MO. So this is the short tool name that NanoHub asks for. It's going to be part of the URL of your tool. And it's going to be part of the invoke script. Um, since it's part of the URL and nobody's actually going to see it if they are not looking for it, you can choose anything. Um, but you know, no funny jokes. And it should be three to 15 alphanumeric characters, no spaces. I think I've had issues before with numbers, but I must be misremembering because this one has a number on it. Um, but yeah, don't need to fret too much about it. People are not going to actually look at it. And so you want to then change this dash lowercase t argument, which is telling with what, what the tool name is to NanoHub with a short name that uh, fits your tool. So for this one, I'm just going to call it widgets. And that will be all for me. And now, and I save that file again. And now I can see what has actually changed in this folder by doing a git status. And I'm going to relaunch uh, the pool see where people are. Okay, we have one need help. So after we like clone it to yep. our computer, you want us to uh, like open the folder we just cloned in our files and change what's in front of dash T in the invoke? Yes, so there's two, two things to cha change in the invoke. Uh, what, yes, dash lowercase t, uh, which is going to be the short tool name that you need to remember or remember that it's written here. Um, and you can pick anything, three to 15 characters. Um, maybe no dashes, that was the issue. Uh, but I don't remember. I think I had a problem with either underscore or dash at some point. So just sticks with letters and numbers. And the other thing is changing here. So let me try to explain uh, this command here. So this invoke script gets called by NanoHub and it actually issues this command that they've made which is invoke app. And you pass a bunch of options to invoke app. I don't know most of them, but I can guess from looking at it. This first capital C is actually passing another Linux command to it, which is opening Jupyter, um, this dash T, I don't remember what it is. Dash A is for app mode and dash capital T is, I don't know either. But then you, you have to pass the actual notebook that we are using and that's the other thing to change. You can either change the contents of uh, tellurium.ipynb or just change the whole notebook, either way. And the other thing to change is the dash T lowercase here with the short tool name. 
And then the rest of the commands is using this environment. So it has a bunch of Python commands in it. We don't need to worry. And this, uh, it's telling which Python installation to use, but we don't need to care or even look at that. So the two things is inside the string, the notebook, and in this lowercase t on line four, the name. And yeah, that's it. Um, and so what I, I changed those, I saved. And what I did then is I went to git bash and I issued a git status to see what changed. And we can see that there is one file that was modified invoke, which we were expecting, and one file that was added, which is widget class.notebook, which we were also expecting. And, you know, just to make sure that I'm not crazy, I'm going to ask GitHub to tell me what the difference is for the file that we modified by using git diff file. And we see that two lines were removed or edited and two lines were added. And we can see that, yeah, we just changed what we meant to change. Um, yeah. And now we can actually Um, you know, bundle everything for a commit and put everything online. So I'm just going to do a git and, and I could list um, these two files one by one. Or I can say everything in this folder by using period. Just as in Linux, double period is a folder up, period is the current folder. So I'm just telling Git to add everything in the current folder to be committed next. And now if I do a, so it was Git add period. Um, and now I'm gonna do a Git status again. And we see things in green, whereas they were in red before, because now they are being tracked and they are uh, ready to be committed. Now, I can do a git commit dash m for the commit with a message. Just say, I don't know, update to my scripts. And to actually get those online, you do a git push, which I'm not going to do because I, I, I don't want to actually break the repository. And I just realized that I, I was about to do that with this push. Um, and, oh, and by the way, on the repository that I have everything, I have the instructions here as well. So. And as you can see, they are actually short. So worst game comes to worse. It's there. Oops. So yeah, I've put everything in a commit and I would push if I were on your side of the screen instead of my side of the screen. And this is why forking it, I thought was a better idea because with it forked, you can just do the modifications, the git add, the commit and push without any more effort. If you had downloaded it 
uh, some the repository some other way you'd have to create a new repository on your profile and then do everything that way which is a bit more work it's not anything major but it's more work and after you push you should see uh, your new message at least in some of these files so it should see the extra notebook and the message and middleware should also be your new message because you changed invoke and that's how you know that you've pushed uh, successfully uh and yeah we have one more thing that we have to actually check um which is making sure that middleware invoke is executable and to do that you have to go to your uh, online version of the repository and go to middleware and go to invoke and if it is executable it will say at the file header the other option is to do a ls dash l middleware yeah and it should have three axes at that start there if it doesn't have the three axes it means that the file is not executable which is something that we have to fix and it's a an easy fix and i mean it doesn't hurt either way even if it's not necessary so you can from git bash when you are in your repo local repository folder you can just issue that command there and that's going to add execution privileges to the file and in my case i won't have anything to commit but Yeah, so as usual with, with Git is all about remembering the verbs. So status is just asking what's changed in the folder in the local repository, if anything. Um, git diff and then a file asks what's the difference. A git pool um you you can think from the point of view of you inside of your computer tower you're pulling stuff into your hard drive into your tower so that's getting stuff from online locally and if you're trying to get stuff out of your tower you're pushing them to the outside and that's getting local stuff to outside and then um get commit and git add is well i never really understood why there those two are separate but they are and you have to add everything that you want to commit and then actually bundle it into a commit so that you can finally push it and committing um is so that things are in discrete chunks. So if we look at all of the commits of this repository, we have a history of what I changed and when and how, and actually something that Andy has changed here as well. Um, and for our purposes of making a tool is not that big of a deal, but when you go to things like this which has 
almost 500 commits, then it's things get more interesting and commits start to make more sense. But yeah, what I what the next step for us is to make sure that invoke is executable. So what I I gave you the command to add execution if it's not there and if you issue that command even if it's it's a, if it is already executable it's not going to do anything. So no hurt in actually doing that. So what I did here as an example is I issued the opposite command. So I removed execution privileges from that file. You can see that I've issued the command with equals minus instead of equals plus. And just as in Python and anything that's removing X from that file and X is short for X executable. And we can see that um, it does detect the change. So if I add that and then commit and finally get it online by pushing it, I can then see the change here. And I can see that the message was updated for middleware because they changed something in a file there by a commit. And the same shows here in the file. And this file does not have executable. If I look at the same file on the other branch, then it has executable, but not in this dummy demo branch. So a series of commands that you want to do is this followed by that followed by And when you open it in GitHub, it should say executable there. And that's all the steps on the GitHub side of things. And actually, if I look here, I can actually check what you did. Yeah. Um, Now on the NanoHub side of things. So, um, where you go going... on the NanoHub side, you should just let people ask questions or review. Yeah. Uh, why don't you True. walk the whole thing one time, one more time slowly, uh, and make sure that everybody can follow. Yep. 
maybe not everybody has used Linux, and so some of the Linux commands may be unfamiliar. And so just yep. just since it, since it's a lot of steps, uh, it doesn't uh, hurt to it doesn't hurt to go over it one more time. Yep. Yeah, so the steps were first to go to uh, this repository, uh, then to fork it by clicking on fork there on the right. Um, then on your forked version to actually clone it, and you do that by clicking code here, copying this link and coming to git bash or whatever and doing a, a git clone and that link and just you can either hit enter and then it's going to create a folder and put everything inside that folder and that folder will be named after the repository or you can add a folder afterwards uh, and it's going to create that folder and put everything inside of that then after things were cloned we first got our project notebook onto the repository folder here, together with Tellurium MyPib. And then we changed uh, middleware invoke to actually open the new notebook that we've put in the folder instead of the default. And we've chosen a short uh, tool name for our tool later on. And you can, at this step, you can still change your mind and pick something else. After we go to NanoHub, then you won't be able to change it ever again. Um, no pressure. We saved it. Then we made sure that things were there by uh, going to... by on git bash going to the repository folder and doing a git status to see if there are any changes in the files of the repository or not. Um, in this case, since I've already committed everything, it uh, returns blank because there is no further changes. If I just typed something here, and did a status, now it says that there is a modification there. Then we've added all modifications that occurred in the folder. So the changes to invoke and the addition of the new uh, file by doing a, so we are adding all of the changes together by git add and period. Uh, period is everything in this folder, every single change. Then we, after that, we've created the commit for all of the changes by doing git commit dash m and some uh, message string. And finally, We've got everything online by pushing everything online with uh, git push, which I'm not going to issue here, this command, because it's going to break the repository. Then we've checked that middleware invoke is still executable by actually opening that file on GitHub. And it says here on the file header if it is or not. If I go here, this version of the file is not executable. But this version is. 
And to fix it, if it's not executable, there is that series of commands there in chat, starting with git update index, followed by adding the change to middleware invoke, committing the change, and pushing the change online. Any questions? Do people need some time? I have a quick question. So sure. like in the invoke file where it says like the widgets underscore class, like mm -hmm. that Python notebook, is that supposed to be like in the file or for the or the folder? Or like yeah, so I've named I've changed it here to widgets class because I violated the file widgets class. If this file, oops, I deleted it by accident. If I, this file was named a notebook, I would put a notebook here. This is just telling NanoHub that we want this file to be opened by default whenever somebody launches the tool. So is that Python notebook just like, did we just like duplicate the Telerillium one or is that? Um... That's going to be your project's notebook. Oh, okay. Yeah. But I guess if you start, if, suppose they were developing their project in NanoHub Delorean. Mm -hmm. So now they have to download that? Yes. So maybe walk them through that again, just start from the very beginning. Yeah, so yeah, I have the here the widgets class file. This is in NanoHub in Jupyter. So if you were doing this and this were your project, you'd go to file, download as notebook, save file, and then you can straight up drop uh, or download it into straight to your repository. And then uh, change which notebook should be open by default in Invoke. The other option, no, I'm not gonna say the other option. But if you, if you don't want to go to invoke and change this, you can just you know, delete this notebook here, the default Tellurium one, and just call your project's notebook Tellurium. And that's one last thing to change in invoke, but you're going to have to change this line either way. Any more questions? Okay. So on to NanoHub. So here I am in NanoHub. I'm already logged in. Um, let me make this bigger because now things show up properly. Yeah. Um, we are creating a new tool. So you can either use this link to go to the creation page. Or you can go to resources at the top, no, no, tools. No, sorry, 
that's wrong. Resources upload slash publish. Because your upload, well, you're going to publish a tool. Uh, then you select resources. Then you scroll down and select tools here. Or, you know, that link, less clicking. And after this page, then your short tool name, which is going to be on this first field, will be locked and unchangeable. So to get to here again, uh, NanoHub's homepage resources at the top, upload, publish, uh, resources again, tools. And now we can just, you know, start filling this up and that's going to pretty much be it. So tool name. For this example, I was naming mine widgets. So I'm just gonna copy from the invoke file. If I do a control C, control V, there is no way I could typo it and have, or I don't know, forget an S at the end, uh, which would be more work later on. Then you can, you give it a title this is going to be a more district district descriptive descriptive title and it can be long i'm not sure how long it can be but you can change it later so if you don't like your title don't worry everything except the tool name is changeable uh so Gonna call mine a Jupyter Notebook showcasing widgets. That's reasonable. And version, um, you can change it from one if you want. At a glance, should be a one phrase description of your tool. In my case, I'm just copying over my title. And now, um, and now we actually tell NanoHub, okay, we, I have this tool. Here is where you should find it. So you're hosting your tool as a Git repository in GitHub. So the third option there. And now they ask what's the URL for the repository. And this URL is the same URL that you used to clone the repository. So if you go to your repo, it's not the URL at the top, but the one under code here. Just copy that, put it there, and you're good. And oops, there is just one more thing to change here which is to tell NanoHub that your tool is a Jupyter Notebook tool. Um, everything else you can leave as is or change it. Um, your call, really. Um, I mean, tool access has to be anyone can run the tool. Uh, and, but your source code, uh, you can have it open or closed, unless James has any oppositions to closed um, source projects. I mean, in general, I think people probably want it open, but if you want it, want it, you can. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So before. Thing you might want to do is if you're going to create, if you're going to create a, a temporary pro, a, basically a placeholder project now, 
which you're not going to be using, you might want to say the project area access to be closed so that you don't put junk onto their server that everyone sees. Yep. Yeah, you can, and you can change everything except the short to name afterwards. Um, so don't worry too much about it. I think the short to name and also the repository URL, those two cannot be changed. And so should people go ahead and do the upload? Yes. Okay. So. Yeah, and in, in this page, really, I just filled it out. The only thing to pay attention to is that the two name has to be whatever you had in invoke with the dash T. Um, that you're hosting it on GitHub and that your two is Jupyter. Everything else is up to you. And after, I don't want to click register to because I already have some. Yeah. yeah. But after you fill this out and click register to, you're gonna see a page uh, like, oh, whatever, I'm gonna click it. Maybe give it a new name like widget two and then you can click. Yeah, well, it's not that issue. It's that I, I've already shown the people how to do NanoHub tools a bunch of times. So I have a bunch of tools hanging on my user. I wanted to maybe avoid having one more. Well, but I think it's important that people see what you got. Yep. Yep. And NanoHub at this can point can, you, can hang. Can you delete the, the ones that you don't need? <sighs> yeah, I think if you haven't actually published it, you can delete them. After you publish, you cannot since you're going to get a DOI for the um, tool. So it is forever. And yeah, I clicked re register already. And for me, NanoHub is just hanging there, which is actually useful to happen here. Because yeah, it's better that you see it happen to me than you get freaked out about it. Um, so if it hangs, things probably went fine. Um, and But if it doesn't, you're going to see a page similar to this. So it is going to have the two information on the left and on the right is actually going to be this image here. So in our case, since we did the GitHub steps first, you can already click on my code is committed working and ready to be installed. This will not make your project public at all. It will only go public after you say that it can go public. And the other thing that you can do here is, oh, this one, okay. So my hunk, cause the tool name already existed. So if I change it and click register, so is it going to hang again? Let's 
seems like it. Yeah, and the other thing uh, that is going to say is to make the page that describes your tool, which in my case here, well, I also have it here, actually. So if I click here, I have a bunch of HTML text boxes. And you just, you know, add everything about your tool in here. You add your abstract uh, powered by, it's going to be Tellurium. Go back to the top and walk through it slowly. Yeah. Yeah. So the title you've sent already in this page. The at a glance, same thing. It's going to be here. Abstract, you write your abstract. Uh, you can upload extra files uh, if you want images explaining the tool or uh, your uh, presentation on it, whatever. And then there are details. Uh, your tool is powered by Tellurium. Um, bio you can add stuff about yourself uh credits who did what for the project uh citations your tool may have which is going to be none since it's it doesn't exist yet your sponsors well references that it may have and publications using the tool Uh, yeah, and the only thing that is required is this first tree. Then you save and go next. Here you can add more people uh, to be contributors. I think it would actually be useful for you to add me as a contributor. Um, that way I think I will also be messaged about your tools and I can go and change stuff um, with you if need be. The only question is which one of me is me? Anyway, um, yeah, so add me, TJ, etc. as contributors. Attachments, another chance of uploading uh, documents and whatever else. And finally, tags. So searching stuff on NanoHub is not the easiest, as you've probably experienced. Tags are supposed to help a little bit. So one tag that you have to put in is Tellurium. And it's going to pull up to Tellurium, put that in. And then put as many tags as you want related to your project. Uh, if it is an SIR model, put SIR. Um, if it is COVID, you know, at COVID. Um, etc. Save and go next. And you're gonna get a preview of your page and you just click finalize. And you have your page tools page done. But the important part was the creation of the tool that widgets to worked. Oh yeah, let's move on to widgets. So widgets are a way of making 
um, uh, or share screen, of making interactive code uh, on you or interactive Jupyter notebooks. So what I've done is I've opened Tellurium here on NanoHub um, just so, to make sure that we are using the same widgets version as it's going to be available to your tools later on. Uh, so to actually organize this. Okay. Yeah, I think this is this. Anyway, so to actually have the widgets available, we need to import something else beyond Tellurium. We need to import IPy widgets. Um, plus chat so that I can send this to you. And I'm also importing this display. To, we may use it, we may not later on. And so I've said that I, I'm, I'm opening this up on Tellurium on NanoHub because I know that Tellurium, the, the widgets available inside of Tellurium are not all of the widgets. Part of the reason is that this widgets version is 7.1.2 and the current version, I think it was 7.8 something or 7.9 something. So it's simply out of date. Um, and so if you look at documentation online, you may see things that doesn't actually work. And we can see all of the options available in widgets if we print tier of widgets. And then we can see all of the things that we have available. Um, drop down is there. Uh, float slider, we are going to use. Int slider, we are also going to use. Uh, I think. I can't remember what was the widget type that I was trying to use earlier, but wasn't available in this version. Um, it was for... I ended up using dropdown from here, which exists, but there were other options that weren't there. So cool, we have the widgets available. Let's actually start using them. So first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to just create a widget. So I'm going to create a int slider widget. So I'm gonna name it, I'm gonna save it in the variable int slider. And it's from the widgets package. And I know that I want the int slider, which is there. So I'm just copying that, that over. And I've simply looked at the documentation for the widgets to figure out what these take, but if we just do that and then actually display it, let's see what happens. Not sure. Okay, so we have a slider that's at zero and goes to 100. So those are the default for the slider. If we do a second one, and we change some options. So let's say instead of from zero to 100, we want it to go from one, so minimum one, uh, to 10. 
we do this. Now we have isolated equals from one to 10. Uh, we can add a description for it. And we can, so that it prints next to the slider there. So I've added description and then a string. And we see that the string shows up there. And the slider still works. And instead of having it start at the minimum value, let's have it start at the halfway point there. Okay, so we've created two sliders already, or at least I did. And I mean, they slide. They don't do much besides that for now. And one thing that I should tell you is that the I've created a, the widgets uh, notebook and I've put it on the Google Drive for you. Just let me grab the link so that you have it and can uh, use it as a guide. We can use that notebook there as a guide uh, for you. We should have everything that I'm going to show. After all, I'm, I'm using it as a guide. That's cool. So we have widgets and they are displaying, but they don't do anything yet. Um, and we, uh, and I mean, this, Sliders are there, but we don't have, even have, have access to the value in them yet. So to actually access the value of a slider, uh, let's call it V. We get the name of the slider object that we've created. And then from that object, we ask for the value. Then let's do something with that value. I'm just going to print the cube of the value. OK, so if now I change this to 6 and rerun this, changes to 216,000, change it back one, but you can notice that I'm having to change the slider and then run the cell again. So not very interactive yet. Uh, to have it interact with something, we have another um, function thing from the widgets package, which is interact. Uh, widgets dot interact. And this will actually make it something interactive. So interact is a interesting function. I mean, so far we've, we've passed values to functions and done things with that. So for instance, here, we are passing uh, v cubed to the function print. Uh, here, we are passing to the function in slider a value for min, a value for max, a value for description, and 
a value for value. But interact expects as its first argument a function, not a value. So its first uh, argument is the function that defines the interaction. So since I was using print in the cube before, I'm gonna define a function that just returns the cube of a value x. And that this function cube has to be, pa uh, I'll pass it to interact. And I pass it as such without open and close or X because I'm not actually asking cube to do anything. I'm just telling interact that it should do something with cube. And then at the, as the second uh, or as the remainder or other arguments, the one that it requires is value. And for value, we are actually going to pass the slider that we made. Um, I'm gonna pass the first one in slider instead of in slider two, but it doesn't matter. Either one should work. Okay, what did I do wrong? Oh, right, 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 right. My mistake, shouldn't be value here. So interact, first argument is a function, cool, cube. Uh, and then the volume following arguments should all, should be the things that cube expects. So cube is expecting something named X. So we have to pass X and that is going to be in slider. And now we actually have it there. And we see that X, 60 and it prints cube of 60. And if I change this, it changes there. And we see the cube also change. If instead of being cube X, I had cube value and also value here. In that case, I would pass value equals the slider and still does the job. So interact first is the function that you are interacting it with and then all of its arguments here. So cube only has one argument. So passing the argument name equals to the slider. And one curious thing that you may have noticed is that when I change here, the slider, I also change it here and vice versa. Um, I'm not going to explain why, but it's something that you need to keep in mind that for sliders, uh, when you use the equal sign, you're not actually passing a copy of the slider with another name. You are using the same slider with another name. So if I create a new cell here and have S3 be equals to int slider and then uh, display S3, we're going to see the same thing. So now we have three versions with three different names, even though this one down here doesn't have a name, um, but they are all linked and the same. So just keep that in mind for when you have a bunch of sliders to give them different names. I've had, when I was making this class, I've had problems with this. Um, but that's neither here nor there. 
So yeah, that's cool. So now we actually have a interactive widget with function. You can also make this more compact uh, using Python magic and decorators. If you want to know more, you can look at the notebook that I've sent you the link, but not going to do that here. What I am going to do is show you how to do more than one argument at a time. After all, when you do your projects, you're probably going to load a model that has a bunch of parameters, and you're probably going to have the user play with a bunch of the parameters. Maybe not all of them, but probably more than one. So what I'm going to do is, well, I'm importing NumPy and Matplotlib, and I'm going to plot an ellipsis, because an ellipsis has two radii. And so we'll see how to do two variables at once. So first, I'm going to define the ellipsis. Um, so have R1 and R2 as uh, the radii for the ellipsis. I have theta, which is always going to be between 0 and 2 pi. And now, who can tell me how to get the x and y for the ellipsis? If you don't know, that's no issue. I mean, this is geometry is not biomodeling. But in the meanwhile, I'm going to create another function called draw ellipsis which is going to be responsible for the drawing. Uh, and instead of a one or two, I'm gonna call it major X and major Y for the X and Y major axes. And then I need to get the x and y from the ellipsis function. And it may seem kind of redundant to have two functions for this, but I do think it's best practice. And it actually, I don't know, I think it makes things easier. Okay, I have x and y, so I need a new figure. So I can just do plt plot x comma y. That's going to be the ellipsis, and then plt show to actually show it. So x, what should be the equation for x? It's very similar to the circle equation, x and y. So in a circle, a circle of radius x or of, of radius r is the x coordinate is x times, uh, or the x coordinates is uh, the radius times the cosine of theta. And the y is the radius times the sine of theta. For an ellipsis, it's just one of the radius and the other radius, instead of being the same radius. Cool, those are defined. Now we need a new interaction for draw ellipsis. So I'm gonna copy here widgets interact. First function is draw ellipsis. And now what do we have to pass to interact? Um, Colin, what should I give interact now? 
Um, you would give it R1 and R2, right? Yes. Yes. But in this case, I'm calling it major X and major Y. So oh, yeah. major X, and this is going to be a slider. I'm just going to leave it blank for now and then copy over from above and major Y. So before I was, I defined the slider and then used the slider, but because of this, duplicates are actually the same being thing. I think it's better to, instead of making the slider and passing the slider, just doing it all at once inside of this function. So I'm gonna hit some returns to make things more readable. So major X, before we were using a int slider, let me copy here. We just int slider. Uh, instead of int, I'm going to use a float slider. And same thing for uh, major y. And then we probably don't want our minimum to be zero. I think that would have. No, I don't think there's going to be any division by zero, but as radius of zero doesn't make much physical sense. So I'm going to have a minimum of 0.5 and a maximum of 50 or 10. Um, now we are in floats. And you could do this for ints as well. I'm going to define the step size for the sliding. Uh, ints by default is by one. I don't know what's the default for floats. But I'm going to have it go in steps of 0.5 as well. And going to have it start with a value of three. And finally, the description will be major x. And I'm just going to copy everything that I passed to float slider for x into y. Just going to change from major x to major y as it is. And to not have a start with a circle, I'm going to change the default value from t 3 to 7 for y. And now if I have it run, I get an error. Um, none type. Oh, OK. Wait, what? None type? Oh, uh, I forgot to actually have ellipses return x and y. So now we have an ellipsis. And it started with a 7 by 3 uh, ellipsis. Unfortunately, it looks wider than it is taller, even though it is taller than it is wider. But what can you do, eh? But we see that the numbers are right there. Um, I tried fixing this. How did I do that? I... Okay. Ah, yeah, and to suppress this message here, I think this is a Jupyter thing that Jupyter always prints the last line of a cell unless it has a semicolon at the end. Yeah. And I don't know why Jupyter does this, ask the Jupyter devs, but this is how you suppress the printing of the last line of code. So if I had, I know, uh, a equals five here and 
b equals one, I'm pretty sure, no, that doesn't print. Hmm. Interesting. So yeah, sometimes then Jupyter prints the last uh, executed line of a cell and you suppress that by adding a semicolon at the, at the last line. Um, yeah. And if I scroll here, we can see that it updates the values live. Uh, but that's already a bit slow, even though it's just an ellipsis. And James mentioned this last lecture that this can be an issue, especially if you have, if you are actually running a model after you make an update, that will be very slow. So one thing that we can do is just gonna copy this to a new line. And then for each of the sliders, we can pass the argument continuous update equals false. But you have to do this for each of the sliders you have. And this changes the update from when sliding to on release. Then it updates. But that's. I mean, for two um, things, not too much typing. For five or 10, a bit more of typing. Another option is instead of passing continuous update to all of the sliders, is to, instead of using interact, to use interact underscore manual. And now we get the new button. So we can change anything we want and it will only update when we click the button. So I change things here, things don't change. Change it here, hit the button, now they change. And this I think is, is the way to go. But if you disagree, that's fine too. Okay, that's all well and good, but this is an ellipsis. It's not your project. So let's actually use this with a more concrete example. I'm going to use it with a SIR with death model. So this is gonna, paste this in chat. There is no point in you typing all of this. And this model I copied uh, straight up from class four or five, if I recall. The only thing that I've added is this flux here for death and the uh, infected to dead rate as well. So um, okay, so now we actually have to have this inside of some function that we can interact with. So we for this one, we have four rates, the infection rate or three rates, the infection rate, the recovery rate, and then the death rate, and also the average number of interactions in a day, which is N. Um, so we can just define a new function, define interactive, SIRD and it's going to take as arguments 
uh, gamma n mu n k i t. And I'm just copying the whole block from above, putting it here. And now we can actually interact with this. So we are going to add a manual interact again. I'm just copying the widgets menu interact from above. The first fun the first thing we pass is the function that we are trying to interact with. And the next four things are the arguments of that function. So I'm just gonna copy them here. Um, with a bunch of equals because um, we don't actually pass the values, we pass the values with the names of the variables. There are reasons for that, that I can imagine why, but I don't think I could explain it. Um, oh yeah, and one thing that I forgot to do here in the function is to actually, so what will this function do? Will it actually change any parameters of the model? And no, it won't, because I have the, the model string hard-coded, I load it to M, and then I simulate. I didn't do anything with the values of the model after it was loaded. So what I forgot to grab was this. So there are two ways of changing uh, model parameters with Tellurium. One is doing this. So if I actually go here and I do this print m dot keys, we can see that m uh, actually has a bunch of dictionary keys that are the species, their concentrations, and also the parameters. So we can do uh, m key, uh, which is a parameter name and value, or we can do m period parameter name equals value. And both are exactly the same thing. Maybe one of the two is slightly faster in execution time, but not sure. And okay, we have the interact here almost ready to go. Just need to add the actual sliders. So what I'm going to do is since I already have the model here, uh, outside of the function scope, and I have it under M, I can make my life easier and have the sliders grow from the default value here to say 10 times that value or uh, one tenth of that value. So I'm gonna go here for our gamma. I want a float slider, of course. And the minimum is going to be whatever value of gamma one is in the model already, uh, divided by 100. Yeah. Close this parenthesis so that I don't forget later. The maximum is going to be similar. going to be 10 times gamma or 100 times gamma to keep it symmetrical. Um, then for a step, let's do 0 0.01. Um, 
description uh, infection rate. And then for the default value, we want the default value. And similarly to the other ones, but before I go there, is there an issue with this? Let's see. Gamma by default is 0.1. So the lower end here is going to be 0 0.001, maybe one extra zero, which is fine. As long as it's not zero, things should work. And the maximum is 100 times that, so it's 10. Okay, then, I don't know, it seems weird to me. And it seems that it's going to be too much. Everything is going, every susceptible person will be infected pretty much immediately if we live this as is. So with the, oops, with the max being a hundred times on the default. We can avoid that if instead of just, you know, using a number, we have it use this here. So now I'm saying that the maximum value is going to be the uh, lower number among one and a hundred times gamma. So it's going to be one. But if I didn't want to think and I knew that sh there should be a maximum and I didn't want to think if my a hundred times my default value is above that maximum, you can just do the minimum of your maximum value in your calculated value. And then for the other ones, I'm just gonna copy from my the other notebook. For the number of daily encounters, I used the int slider again, because I thought, well, you can't have five and a half encounters in a day but we could actually leave it as a float slider because it's the average number of encounters a day. So if one person has uh, 10 encounters in a day and another has one, the average then is 5.5, which is fine. For mu, I did the exact same thing as I did with for gamma, but with the mu values, and for the death rate, uh, infected to D rate, same as gamma and mu, just with the other ones instead of, uh, no, with the proper one. Why is it not? Oops. Yes. Ah, the message was too long, I see. So you have the code there, but it broke at the very end. So just keep that in mind if you're copying from chat. If you run this, that uh well, yeah, let's first. Uh, remove that function main blah, blah blah at the end. And here we have it. If we click run, it's the same as this. We didn't, haven't changed anything yet. If we change the daily encounters to 50 and run again, did it change anything? Maybe, but I'm not seeing it. No, it's not working. Ah, I know why, because 
I hadn't rerun this function folder, uh, this function cell after I fixed the, the lack of update. So now if I run, change this, yeah. Cool. So if, seems that if with everything else being the same, and no mutations and a low death rate. Seems that the Brits at the start of the pandemic and Brazil uh, were right in not doing anything and just having people infect themselves because then everything is recovered. So that's assuming that a SIR model of the pandemic is correct, which is not. That's the part of the memo that they didn't get, I guess. And if we increase the death rate, we see that the number of dead people goes up and so forth. Cool. But saying that you have multiple models, one SIR and one SIRD, and you're telling your user to choose one of them. What you do then is you'd have them both in the same um, function and you'd have something making a switch between the two options or however many options you have. So, Uh, I have that here. I'm going to create a new function called SIR or SIRD. And I already have this select switch. So it can either be SIRD, and then the model string is this with the infection going to death. And if it is SIR, then simply I don't have that flux there. And that's it. Uh, and then the rest of the function is very similar to before. We load the model just the same. Because uh, in both cases, I'm saving the model string to model string. And then we have to modify everything we want to modify about it, then simulate, and then plot. However, if this function is left as is, and the person selects SIR, there is a mistake here. Because if they select SIR, this value simply does not exist in M. So we have to only do this if SIR, SIR is not selected. In other words, if SIRD is selected. So I'm just copying the same if and putting it there. And another thing that I have on my other screen that I'm cheating off of is I have a an emergency escape, which is say the user didn't select SIRD nor SIR. It's gonna break here. And it may be a confusing error message. Let's see. Um, let's see what the actual error message is. So I'm going to pass one instead of uh, an actual string. Doesn't matter. Just wanted to fail both of those ifs. Yeah. So we got the, the error that 
this variable doesn't exist yet and you're trying to use it. That's illegal. Um, so I have this emergency escape after my ifs, which is just a raise value error. Yeah. Okay. I think I did quite a bit. How? Um, not sure how far you followed, but I think something that might be interesting is uh, for you to share some example that you may have, and we can implement the interaction for it right now. Um, and see how that goes. I've already called on Colin today. So, Drew, you're next in line, at least on my screen. Do you have any? Need examples that we could try to apply the interact to. Um, I'm actually following along on another computer, so I'm not going to be able to share. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, that's fine. Um, Ali? Uh, I don't really have anything to um, share right now. Um, it's not necessarily to share anything. It's just if you have a, a model that maybe it can be some other model from class, we can implement the interact for that one. But anyway, um, Benjamin? Yeah, I've been following along on the uh, uh, the, what's it called? The uh, hold on, I'll pull up the file name. Uh, the the one that I put online. Yeah, that one. Uh, which it's class. Uh, yep. so. Um, I mean, if uh, uh, if there was a little bit of time, uh, a little bit more time, I could find a model from elsewhere and then sort of graft it onto what's already here. Yep. Uh, if you wanted, but uh, that would take a bit. Yeah. Uh, no. Mostly because I'd have to, I'd have to locate where all my files are. My computer's an absolute mess. Yeah. Don't worry about it. That was kind of improvisation on my part. We can, we can just, you know, carry on and show you uh, how to actually have the selection. So I tried, before I did uh, this checking of the version and what options are there, I tried, um, I think, combo box. Um, there were some other options in the more recent documentation, but none of them are here. The one that works for us, since we have two options, is the dropdown. So I already have the interact manual here. Um, just that drop down here for now. So first that we want to pass is select, which is going to be a widgets, drop down, uh, and then for drop down, you have to pass a list of options, which is unsurprising. And you can pass some description. So the only options are SIRD and SIR and description model options. And then uh, the rest of it, we can just copy from here. It's all going to stay the exact same. Yep, 
this seems to work. So this should be just as before, uninteract, a death rate that, ah, cool, right. So this is more like Ebola. Everybody dies before anybody gets infected. Uh, and then if I change to SIR, get this. And now, of course, the death rate does absolutely nothing for the SIR model. The other uh, options do still do stuff as we'd expect. And easy to switch from one to the next. And the final thing that I want to show you is, well, this graph for these options is all well and good. But if we look again at the default, the number of dead people is way lower than everything else. So it's a bit hard to appreciate how many people have died and to compare things. Um, and it's really easy to separate plots into different windows by using matplotlib's subplots. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna grab the simpler one, which is just one model option SIRD. I'm gonna put it here and I'm just gonna change the function name. Um, and up until plot, everything stays the same. I'm gonna remove the plot. And now I'm going to create a two by two subplots. So we have four lines. So making a two by two makes sense, but you can have a one by two, a six by six, uh, any number of plots. If you're, say uh, for this example, uh, the comparison of SIRD and SIR, if we were telling the user to actually compare the two and how things changed, we could have one plot here and the other plot next to it. And that makes it easy to look from one to the next. Um, and doing it one next to each other is a bit harder than one below each other. One below we just call plot on both of them and to do them deals of it to have it next to each other, you have to use matplotlib. So to create a two by two, um, we have to use a bit more than just you know plt.figure and just keep using commands. We have to actually name our figure variable something calling it fig and we also need um, an axis object and this axis axis is, i don't know um, will actually be each of the four blocks of um, plotting so what we want is from matplotlib, we want subplots. There is also a function subplot without an S. They are not two names for the same thing. They work differently. I can never remember which one is which. And now we can actually plot the stuff in each of these subplots. So let, let's actually just uh, plt show here. And I'm just going to call this with one, 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 one. And we see we have four plots. So on this one, we are gonna plot the susceptible ones. Here, we are gonna plot the infected, the recovered, 
and the dad. So X is um, is actually a matrix. If I uh, print X uh, shape, you see that it's a two by two matrix, just as this is a two by two plot matrix. So top left is going to be the first element of the matrix. So first line, line zero, first column, column zero, and we want to plot on it. And we want to plot the um, successible against time. So we actually have to grab these values from M. So time is easy enough. It's M uh, square brackets time string. Then S is not as, it has a nuance that is easy to forget. It's M square brackets uh, string but not of S, but of square brackets of S. Because tellurium was built with chemical concentrations in mind, and concentrations are usually denoted by just using square brackets. So we are, actually, we are asking the model to give us the concentration of S, even though it's not a concentration in our case. And actually, I'm gonna instead of plotting S directly, I'm gonna plot it as, as a percentage of the total population. So I'm just dividing M a uh, string of square brackets S uh, by M square brackets S naught. And I'm gonna have each of the subplots have a title so that things aren't confusing for the user. So X is zero, zero should have its title set. So set title. I think if, it, if we weren't doing subplots, just title wouldn't work, but here it's set title because matplotlib is not consistent. And the title is going to be susceptible population percentage. And if I call this now, uh, I didn't plot anything because I guess my values were bad. Uh, Just gonna add stuff. One third one is new. Final one is KID. Strange. Have the PLT show. Oh, right. So I was using M here. That's wrong. I should be using S because M is the loaded model. S is the results of the simulation of the model. So that's why nothing was being plotted. So S, S, the final one can stay as M because we are just dividing by the value of S naught. Now we see that things go, everybody gets infected eventually. And since I'm actually saying that it is a percentage, I'm gonna multiply by a hundred 
there. And we do the same thing for the next three axes. So the second one, we want to plot the infected population. So here I'm just going to change S to I. The third one, I'm going to change uh, capital S inside of the square brackets to R. And the final one with D. But right now I'm putting everything in the same axis. So it's just what we had before, but with a wrong title name. So we actually want the second one to be plot, uh, plotted on the second axis. So it, we are still on the first line. So this should stay at zero. Now we are at the second column. So zero comma one. Then for the third one is one comma zero. We are on the second line, first column. And the final one is one, one. Ta -da. Now we have the four variables in four different plots. But things are overlapping. That's an easy fix. We tell matplotlib that it should use tight layout when layouting stuff, then it figures out that it shouldn't have text overlap. And the interactive version of this is the exact same as this one, just with a different function. So I'm just going to copy the same thing here and just change the function there. And ta-da, things in different plots, and things change. And that's how you do sliders. Um, for uh, this, the notebook that I gave you, I've put at the top that I, I got some inspiration from previous year projects. I also looked at some online blogs on it and I put the links to them at the top as well as the link to the documentation for uh, the IPy widgets. The only thing that you have to keep in mind is that the documentation is gonna be for version seven, eight or seven, nine. Uh, and the version that we have access to is seven, one. So some things, uh, may not work. And that's all that I had for, you for today. And one thing you see there actually in that slider is the fact that the, the uh, text that you attach to the slider is a fixed length. Yep. And my recollection is that that's actually not an easy thing to change. Well, it seems that is a, it is actually a function of the zoom on the page. Uh, so if I have my page at 110%, then I can see everything. But if I go up or down, it doesn't show. It shows again at 80% and 60. Huh. Weird. But yeah, that's an issue I'm not sure if there is any easy fix to force it to show everything oh actually i just thought of one if i in the string here put a backslash n no that doesn't work backslash n is for a new line so i was hoping that it would do my first return slider but it didn't. Did he? Has anybody in the class in the work they've been doing uh, come up with any 
useful or interesting strategies or problems that you'd like to go over now? I think it's a good time to talk about these issues. If you're thinking, beginning to think about creating your projects for for NanoHub, then it's these are the kinds of uh, technical details. <clears throat> so far in this class, we're trying to avoid dealing with technical details, but but when it comes to actually creating a NanoHub app as opposed to doing some simulations and uploading it, then there isn't any way around the technical issues. Yep. And so now yep. is a great time where you've got Giuliano to talk about it or discuss anything that you might have on your mind about. Okay. I mean, I haven't got uh, into the uh, sort of into the weeds with the interactive portion yet, but um, uh, there's um, uh, you mentioned earlier documentation for these, uh, so maybe uh, is that something that we can just like Google? Yeah, yeah, I I found it with uh, just searching for. Uh, Jupiter widgets, but uh, I have the link here, and it's also on the um, on that uh, Jupiter notebook that I that I shared earlier in the chat, and that notebook is also on the student folders on Google Drive, so you can access it multiple ways. Uh, and yeah, it, uh, at the top, there are links uh, to the documentation, a couple of blogs, and two projects that I copied things from. I mean, one thing that Giuliano mentioned that I will, will say again before is that if you're, do, if you're not using developing your application in the NanoHub Tellurium, but you're doing it in on your desktop in a different IDE, then you want to be a little bit careful because not every IPy widget is implemented in NanoHub. And so, if you uh, if you design a beautiful application that depends on a, an IPy widget that is not available, then it could be frustrating. I mean, we could. In principle, go to NanoHub and say, please, by the way, update IPy widgets on NanoHub. Uh, but I wouldn't count on that. Yep. Um, did you get the integer slider to work? Because I th that if, if it does, then maybe they changed it. Because I remember, I think the integer slider didn't work in, in, when I used it uh, a year ago. Yeah, it worked for me, uh, both when doing the simple examples and when doing the model i used it for the um, number of encounters in a day and what about select from a list that too uh the one that i had to use was let me be sure Yeah, so to select from a list uh, here, drop down, widgets, drop down, and then you have a list of options. So it may be that they fixed some of the problems we ran into us. Yeah, yeah, when I was actually looking this up, the documentation told me to use something else that isn't there. And then it had a second option that also isn't there. Um, and then I, I did the sprint here and just scanned this and saw a drop down. Okay, I have an option then. I remember one of the ones that I think was not there was the, the free text entry. Yeah, I remember you saying that. Um, but I mean, it has HTML. 
has buttons like maybe that's or button and button style maybe button would be like radio buttons so let's see well i think for the things that people are likely to do there should you should be able to find the things that you need but uh, yeah again I, I i i just don't want somebody to to develop a uh, the application locally and then discover that something that they need for it doesn't doesn't exist. That's not a widget. That's also not a widget. Okay. Yeah, but drop down exists, uh, and then with drop down and the sliders, I think you should be good for anything. Oh, radio buttons. Yes, that's it. So like multiple text or text area toggles. Seems to be there. Okay, so I hope things will work here because Zoom has been acting up for me. Um, so I was trying to get that debugged uh, during the Juliano's presentation, but we'll see. Okay, so we were talking about how to build a model of in-host viral infection last time and we had come up with this basic model which uh, we've seen many times now uh, and it's probably worth having people uh, think about that and we'll see what we can do in, in half an hour which is not a lot of time uh, we had the idea of uninfected potentially infectable cells our T cells uh, going into an eclipse phase I1 cell uh, with, at a rate that depended on the amount of virus and the number of infectable cells. The I1 cells becoming I2 cells, that is going from eclipse phase to virus releasing at a rate K times I1. The virus releasing cells dying at a rate d times i2 the dead cells don't do anything although you could imagine a situation in which the dead cells actually uh, are replaced by uh, new uninfected cells in which case you have d goes to t that would be like a, a recovery process uh, in uh, in the sir model an sirs model in that case and then we also had the creation of virus by the I2 cells, in this case, P times I2 going to virus, and viral clearance representing the fact that virus doesn't sit around forever, it gets eliminated, uh, C times V. And when we ran that uh, with basic parameters that we could eyeball from the experiment, uh, we got a simulation that actually did pretty well. Uh, it had the latent phase that we observe in the experiment. It had that rapid exponential growth in that phase two regime. It had saturation and then a gradual decay. And that's about as far as we can get uh, with that basic model. There isn't a lot more we could do with it. Uh, and we discovered uh, unsurprisingly that the uh, that the slopes that we measured off of the experimental data uh, worked when we put them into the simulation. Now, it's not surprising that if you measure an experimental par a parameter uh, in from the experiment that it should the model should correspond to the experiment, uh, but it does suggest that our intuition about how the system worked was pretty good. 
if the model was structurally wrong, then using the right quotation mark parameter would work. And so we got something that looked like this. Uh, and that, again, matched pretty well that early part of our plot. And then we started talking about the how to get that final viral clearance. And then things get more complicated because the biology got more complicated. We started talking about the adaptive immune system. And in the adaptive immune system, uh, there are a number of things that are going on first. Uh, there are cytokine signals from the tissue that's infected that uh, go off and reach uh, the lymph nodes. And secondly, there actually are cells uh, that move uh, back and forth between uh, the infected tissue and the lymph nodes. In particular, um, cells that have died in the infected tissue are endocytosed, eaten uh, by the precursors to dendritic cells. The dendritic cells uh, migrate to the lymph nodes. They select in the lymph nodes cells that uh, recognize the particular antigens related to the virus. And those cells, in turn, after cell replication, uh, move back through the bloodstream, exit the bloodstream, go into the tissue, and begin to attack uh, the infected tissue. And so that uh, cell-mediated response is, is complicated, and there are a couple of issues that we're going to run into when we try to model it. Um, and there's a, here's just a little bit of biology, which we were talking about last time. Uh, the key players in this are T cells, um, and there are a lot of them. Uh, if you're talking about cancer, I know Josh was on the call earlier, uh, uh, T regs, which help shut down the T cell response, are important. Uh, we're going to neglect that for the moment. So again, what we need to do is take this complicated pattern of uh, spatial temporal response and think about how we can model that in a simple uh, OD model of the kind that we've been looking at um, and uh, what that model might look like. Uh, all of this again is to get that cut off at seven days where we eliminate the virus. Conceptually again the signal starts in the lung it moves to the lymph node. The cells of the lymph node replicate, and then they move back to the lung. And we have to think about how to represent that. And so before we start actually uh, doing that, uh, we might want to think about uh, what I would call phenomenological rate loss. And that is that when we're talking about chemical reactions, uh, there are usually good reasons for chemical reactions to have the forms that they have. Uh, when you write A plus chem molecule A plus molecule B goes to molecule C, uh, at least to begin with, you almost always write what's called the mass action law, which says that the rate of the reaction is proportional to A times B. And there's a simple reason for that, which is that if you don't have any A, you can't have a chemical reaction. If you don't have any B, you can't have a chemical reaction. And the simplest functional form that is zero when A is zero and zero when B is zero is A times B. Um, when we start talking about these kinds of biological systems, we don't have the first principles understanding of chemical reactions that we have. Um, but as we saw with the simple model that we wrote, um, it works pretty well. And so one of the things that we might want to think about is in the absence of first principles information about what 
the dependence is of a rate on the variables that we know about, um, we might ask, how do we start out determining what a rate law could be? And there are some simple conceptual ideas that are important uh, that I think uh, in some years I've taught this material very early in the class, and I think then, then it seems to be too abstract. Um, but I think at this point, if you're building models yourselves and you've seen enough uh, rate laws and, and uh, examples of SIR models, BSIRD models, and now uh, in-house models, <coughs> and with the, with the uh, replication simulations we did a few weeks ago, I hope these ideas are, are simple. So suppose that we need to have a rate law, and the rate law could be what is the rate at which uh, T goes to I1 as a function of the amount of virus. Uh, that's a possible rate law. One that's actually probably more uh, interesting would be what's the rate at which virus is produced by our I2 cells. And if we're going to build a phenomenological rate law, uh, there are some simple rules of thumb that we can use that help us limit the choices we have to evaluate. And the first thing that I would uh, talk about are what are called limiting cases. And so if you have a parameter or variable and you want to know what the rate does as a function of that parameter or variable, uh, typically what you will do is uh, think about what happens in the limits that's why it's a limiting case of that parameter variable being small and being large. So let's take the example here of T goes to I1. In the case of T goes to I1, that is uninfected cells becoming infected, uh, we already said something, which is if there is no virus, then the rate of infection better be zero. You can't be infected if there's no virus. Similarly, if there are no uninfected cells to infect, the rate of infection better be zero. Otherwise, I'll wind up with a negative number of uninfected cells, which is impossible. And so we know that when T is zero, the rate of infection, whatever it is, has to be zero. Uh, there are other times when we might imagine that when our variable is zero, the rate is constant and non-zero. In general, our rates aren't going to go negative because we're not going to have a negative amount of something uh, if we're describing amounts. But we have to think about what happens at zero. And so the first thing you'll do is say, if the rate of new infections uh, is a function of t, what is that rate when t is zero? In this case, it has to be zero. And so I've drawn here a, a schematic which has a parameter, a variable on the x-axis, and a rate or a value on the y-axis. In this case, if that parameter is zero, then the rate has to be zero as well. What it doesn't tell you is what happens to the slope. Uh, is it slope zero, zero, or finite slope at zero? If the rate, if the value at zero were non zero, uh, then we could have a positive, negative, or zero slope. And so that's something to think about. So I've already gone through some of these kinds of arguments. Um, in this case of the model that we have here, if we have no T cells, no uninfected cells, 
the rate of new infections has to be zero. Similarly, if we have no I1 cells, no eclipse phase cells, the rate at which they become virus releasing cells has to be zero. It also makes sense, uh, and this is a little bit more problematic, is we have to think about the slope. If I have very few T cells, and I increase the number of T cells a little bit, does the rate stay zero or does the rate go up? If I have very few I1 cells, and I increase the number of I1 cells a little bit, does the rate at which I1s become I2s stay zero or go up a little bit? And in both of these cases, because the rates are independent cell by cell, we would expect that if we have very few T cells or very few I1 cells, that the rate of new infection or the rate of production of I2 cells would be proportional to the number of T cells or the number of I1 cells. That is, the slope here this is like this green line, not the blue line. So if the slope of my rate law is non-zero at zero, positive at zero, uh, then at least the lowest order behavior is always going to be this linear function. Other things can happen later, but that linearity is going to be the case. If for some reason I believe that the slope of that function is zero at zero and near zero, uh, then we're going to get something called the Hill function, and we'll come back to that in a bit. Um, so uh, if you ask the question, uh, what happens uh, to the value of the rate at zero, and what happens to the change of the value of the rate as we go just above zero, that already gives you a big constraint on what's possible in terms of the function. So, if we think then, we try to outline this here, uh, when the amount of a species is zero, the rate at which that species reacts has to be zero. Otherwise, we wind up with a negative amount. And we expect also that for uh, small amounts of a given species, increasing the amount should increase the rate. And that, in general, is going to be is going to be true for most of the things that we look at. Um, there's, if you want to think about it mathematically, suppose that a rate law is a function f of a variable x. If we think back to Calculus 1, we remember the Taylor expansion. If x is small, uh, we can expand f of x around uh, 0. So f of x is f of 0 plus x times the derivative of f plus x squared times the second derivative and so on. The first rule that we've written down when the image is 0, the rate must be 0. That zero has to be zero. So that first term drops out. Rule two says that uh, in most cases, and we may run into somewhere it's not true, uh, if the slope is non zero at zero, then F prime, the slope, is positive. And that means that our function is going to look like f of x is x times f prime of 0 plus other stuff. If x is small enough, this first term is bigger than the other terms. Remember, that's how Taylor expansions work. And that means that for small values of x, f of x is approximately x times f prime of 0. F prime of zero is precisely this 
parameter beta or k or d or p or c that we see here. And so what this is telling us is our function has to be linear uh, in x. Um, if we had dependence on multiple variables or parameters rather than one, uh, the only case that shows up in the equations we have here is t goes to i1, because that's a function of v and t, both of which are variables. Uh, we could do a second-order Taylor expansion. I won't walk you through it. Uh, but you wind up with exactly the same thing. You wind up with f now is a function of x and y. And the lowest order term is x times y times the second derivative of f with respect to x and y. That is exactly this first function here. Beta is the second derivative of f. X is v and y is t. And this bilinear form, again, in chemistry is called mass action. So on the lower side of things, that's all you need. Now, when you're thinking about your problem, you want to jump and you want to think about what happens when you have a lot of virus or a lot of cells. And in this case, uh, there are more possibilities. Um, but there's a key question, which is, can the rate of whatever the process is that you're talking about uh, go to infinity or does it stay bounded as you increase the variable? For example, if I have a tissue and I put a virus over the cells in the tissue and I keep increasing the amount of virus, does the rate at which new cells become infected keep increasing or not? And I guess I can ask that as a question. Maybe maybe a show of hands uh, from people. How many people would say that as I increase the amount of virus, uh, the rate of new cell infection keeps going up? You can use your button. Somebody says no. Anybody else? Can you repeat okay. the question one more time? Okay, so suppose that I have a, a, a tissue um, like your lungs, and I now put virus into your, into your lungs, and I'm going to infect some of the uninfected cells in the lung. As I keep increasing the amount of virus, does the rate of new infections per new infected cells keep going up or not? No. Okay. Drew, do you have an opinion on it? We can, no. Okay. Right. I suppose it's actually here on the screen. So it's, it's, uh, but, but yes, absolutely. You're right that the number of the rate of infection can't go up without limit. Uh, each cell can only be infected once. And so if I have a very large amount of virus, most of that virus never infects any cells. And so I expect, expect to see some kind of saturation, where as I increase the amount of virus, uh, the infection rate goes up initially, and then it reaches some steady state. That, that, that level may be very high, and the amount of virus I need to get there may be very high, but at least at some, in principle, uh, it has to saturate. Notice that in terms of the number of cells being infected, there's no need for the rate to saturate. If I have an infinite number of cells, uh, the rate could be very large. Um, and so I don't necessarily have to have saturation that's the same in both variables. And so then I can ask the question now, if the, if the variable is very large, like the amount of virus, do I expect the rate to go back to zero, which is possible, um, stay 
at some intermediate constant level or run off to infinity. And I can also ask the question about what's the slope at infinity or for very large values of the value. And infinity behaves in a slightly funny way. At zero value, if the at, at, at zero value of the variable, if the rate is zero, the slope of the rate as a function of the variable can either be zero or positive can't be negative because the value can't go negative. Um, at infinity, if I want to have the value be zero or a constant non-zero, it can't be going up, it doesn't mean anything, it can't be going down. On the other hand, uh, if the value diverges at infinity, then the value can have a slope of zero, uh, a finite slope, uh, or a slope that increases without bound. So you have three, three possibilities. In general, we're not going to see things run away, uh, except perhaps linearity because of the number of cells. Uh, and so in most cases, when we're dealing with these kinds of situations, we're going to have the value goes linearly in one of the variables. Uh, if I have twice as many cells, the rate of infection is twice as large. Uh, or we have saturation. And so the most common situation that we're going to see is the situation of zero, zero. The value is finite at infinity. The slope is finite, non-zero at zero, and the slope is zero at infinity. And that's what I've drawn in that picture. Um, and uh, we want to know what functional forms we can use to specify that. I've got in the slide in the notes, in the, in the text, the concept of a rate-limiting step. And that can come think about with help uh, build your intuition about uh, what is happening. And when we talk about immune cells, uh, rate limiting steps are, can be quite important. Um, with an immune cell, an immune cell has to literally crawl around an infected cell. It's going to kill that infected cell. And it takes some time to do that. It'll uh, a natural killer cell or a, cyto, a, C, a CD8 plus T cell will crawl around uh, in the lungs. It'll find an infected cell, that cell uh, synapse to the uh, infected cell, and it will then kill it. And it takes some time to kill the target, uh, something on the order of 20 minutes or 40 minutes to do that. Uh, and it also takes time for it to find, go from the cell it's just killed to the next cell it's going to kill. Uh, depending on the density of infected cells in the lungs, uh, that 40-minute time to do a single killing could be longer or shorter than the time it takes to get from one infected cell to the next. So depending on the situation, uh, the killing time might be rate-limiting, might determine how many infected cells each immune cell can kill, or the separation, the, 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 fi the search time would be rate limit. And we can think about those kinds of questions uh, again and again and again. Uh, if you're hungry and looking for a restaurant, uh, the question about where you go will be different if you're in New York City, where there's a restaurant in every street corner from driving I-65 I up to Chicago, where there might be a restaurant every 40 miles. The thing that in one case will determine how long it to find the restaurant might be picking one in New York, and the other one might be the time it takes you to drive 40 miles uh, on the highway. And so it takes a finite amount of time to achieve 
uh, that's a common cause of saturation or rate limitation. Uh, in general, the kinds of ODE models that we are working with don't allow for a direct representation of something taking a finite amount of time. Um, the transition from our eclipse cells to our virus releasing cells, in reality, it takes a minimum amount of time. There are no cells that go from infected to virus releasing in a millisecond or a second or even 10 seconds or 100 seconds. Um, our model says that they change continuously in time. And so that's something to be aware of. It winds up that if we're going to specify a curve that has zero at zero and has non-zero slope at zero and a finite value at infinity, there really are only three things that we care about. The slope at zero, the value at infinity, and the position where the value reaches half of its maximum value. If we specify those three numbers, uh, we don't have a lot of wiggle room in terms of the shape of this curve. Um, and that typically is done using uh, what is called the Michaelis form. Uh, if you've done chemistry, uh, you'll have run into that many times. But the Michaelis equation is something that, uh, Michaelis form is something you run into in phenomenological models as well as in chemistry. And you can write it in multiple ways, uh, but the simplest way to write it is to say that you have uh, a maximum rate V, which would be that value at infinity. And now I want to multiply it <coughs> by something that has a non-zero slope at zero and a zero value I mean, a constant value at infinity. In particular, I want to have value one at infinity. And I've just, I just said that wrong, actually. I said that the maximum rate, and this is actually, this I have to fix the slide because of the way I wrote this equation isn't what I want. Um, if I write it here in the second form, uh, V is X over one plus K over X. And I ask what happens uh, when X gets to be very large. Uh, if X is, let's start at the zero end. If X is very small, then one plus X over K is approximately one, and I get V times X. So this is telling me that the slope at zero is V which is what it should have written here instead of maximum rate. If I have X be very large, then the one doesn't matter. And I have X over X divided by K, the X cancels and I get V divided by, it's V times K, me, V times K. And so that means that that maximum value is V times K. And so this should have been the slope at zero, and the maximum value here is V times K. So if I know the slope at zero, I know V. If I know the value at infinity, I can say that's equal to V times K. I've already got the value of V, and then I can determine the value of K. If X is much less than K, uh, then the rate increases linearly with X. If X is much greater than K, the rate is, and again, this is written incorrectly, the rate is V times K, and it's independent of X. Notice that if X equals K, one O plus K over K is two, and so I have this half maximum here uh, when X equals K. Uh, what if things were decreasing rather than increasing? Um, if things are decreasing rather than increasing, my value is finite at zero. It means my slope is either zero or negative. Could be positive, I guess. Uh, but my value is zero at infinity. 
Uh, that's a decreasing function. Uh, I can write the, the decreasing Michaelis constant in the same form, V times 1 over 1 plus X over K. If X is 0, this is just V, so my initial value is 0, was, is V. If X is very large, this goes to V times K divided by X, and it'll decay to 0 as 1 over X. And that's a, a standard structure that we'll run into again and again. Um, there are other functional forms that I could run into, uh, increasing exponential and decreasing exponential. Uh, increasing exponential isn't used that often. Decreasing exponential is used very commonly. Uh, if you have multiple species, a function of the, the say, the amount of virus and the number of target cells, or a function of the number, what, if I want to know something like, what's the rate at which cells are killed by, infected cells are killed by immune cells? Well, if the number of infected cells is zero, the rate has to be zero. If the number of immune cells is zero, the rate of killing has to be zero. However, the functional relationship by which those two things, the, the rate of killing increases, is not so obvious. And there are multiple functional forms that I could imagine. Uh, if I have a function of f of x and y, I could imagine it's the product of two Michaelis functions, or it could be something where I combine the two terms in the denominator or the numerator in different ways. And there, your intuition is harder is harder to, to come back to. Um, so maybe we're, we're out of time um, for tonight. I want to, uh, next time, we'll come back and we'll look at these functional forms in a little bit more detail. Uh, you might want to think about some examples of this. And I'll try to come up with a homework assignment. Uh, to have you think about this. I may give you a few of the examples I was going to do in class uh, as homework, simple homeworks, uh, where you can think about a situation, uh, uh, for example, the one that I've just enunciated. Uh, I'm in the lung. There's some fraction of my cells are infected. I have some number of NK cells, natural killer cells, that are migrating in the lung and going to kill the target cells. And I want to ask the question, what's the rate of cell killing as a function of the number of target cells that are infected and a function of the number of immune cells? Clearly, if I have a finite number of immune cells, there's a maximum rate at which they can kill. If I have a finite number of target cells, there's a maximum rate at which they can be killed. So if I have a finite number of target cells and I increase the number of immune cells to infinity, I don't increase the, the killing rate to infinity. Similarly, if I have a finite number of cells, I increase the number of target cells to infinity, the rate of killing doesn't go to infinity. So you might want to think about that problem uh, uh, over the next, uh, next week. This is something we haven't really addressed which is, if you look at a biological problem, how do you know what kind of model to write down? And we're not going to spend as much time in class, perhaps, as, as we should on this problem. Uh, but uh, if you were ever going to start building models on your own, as opposed to do, replicating models that have been published elsewhere, these are the kinds of questions that you want to ask. And so I think I'll stop there tonight. Are there any questions before we break? I know that was a lot of very disparate material. You had uh, GitHub, you had sliders, and how you have principles of modeling and saturation. Could you um, give like a quick definition of what saturation is? I'm a little confused about what that means. Okay, saturation means that as this parameter goes up, the value reaches as it does And so that, that simply the saturation means that as a function of parameter, the value is bounded.
So you might be say, uh, as class goes on, uh, the amount that I can absorb from the lecture goes down because I get out of me. Uh, and therefore, the amount of material that I can absorb uh, in a single sitting is bounded because if I sit for a very long amount of time, the amount I'm going to absorb per unit time keeps going down. So uh, that's literally how we tend to use the word saturated. I've heard too many advertisements. I can't absorb another one. So, so, in so uh, sorry, in regards to like the rate limiting step, is it kind of like a cause and effect relationship where the rate limiting step causes the saturation or? Well, that's often the case. So, so suppose that suppose that uh, I I so I can think I'm trying to think of a good a simple example. Suppose that I am uh, something from some kind of comic movie. Suppose that your task is that I throw you a baseball a baseball. You catch it in your glove, and you're supposed to take the baseball and put the baseball in a box. Maybe a tennis ball would be better, but I guess you don't catch it in a glove. Okay. And so once you catch the ball, it takes you some amount of time to go put it in the box and get ready to catch the next one. If I throw the ball to you very infrequently, I throw you one ball every five minutes, then you catch all of them and put them in the box. If I throw a ball to you every two minutes, and it takes you 10 seconds to put it in the box, you can still catch all of them. So in that regime, the rate at which you catch the balls and put them in the box is determined by the rate I'm throwing them to. It's linear. On the other hand, once I'm throwing them to you every 10 seconds, you're running, putting them in the box, and as soon as you're back, you're getting another one. If I now throw them to you every five seconds, you can't catch any more, you'll miss them. And so the rate limiting step there is the time it takes you to catch it and put it in the box. You can't process any more than that. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Maybe yeah. we we'll can come up with a better metaphor, but I think that would be an example. So, so. That would be, but that's a good question. Thank you very much. And this issue of getting saturated by listening to things is something, I, mean, I know these are long classes, so I was joking a little bit, but I wasn't really joking. I recognize that our ability to absorb new material goes down as we, as we sit. It may go off a little bit at the beginning because it may take time to focus during the beginning of the class. So your, your ability to process new material may go up and then come down again. Yeah. That particular case where it goes, starts low, goes up, and then comes down again is one of the more complicated ones that we're not probably going to talk about in detail. But that was a great question. Any other questions? I, I know that we're not used to talking about problems this way, so I think it's important to do a little bit of that. Thank you, Ali, for asking.